Hello, and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be talking about the first section of Chapter 10, uh, Section 10.1 for Math 1040, the language of hypothesis testing. Here, we're going to do basically the crux of statistics, which is where we're going to find values from a sample and try to say something about a population. However, we're going to go into that with some assumption or what we believe to be true, and our goal is to either to show that hypothesis is correct or to refute that hypothesis. A hypothesis just being a statement about a characteristic of the population. That characteristic might be a mean, it might be a median, it might be a standard deviation, some value about a population that we hopefully want to say something about or to just find out itself. When we conduct what we call hypothesis tests, it'll be a procedure that's based on sample results, so it's based on results that we get from a sample that will allow us to test and say something, hopefully, about the, the hypothesis that describes the, the population. So getting values from a sample to try to say something about a population. As a quick example here, we have a friend of yours wants to play a simple coin flipping game. If the coin comes up heads, you win. If the coin comes up tails, your friend wins. Suppose the outcome of five plays is, the, is uh, tails, 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 tails. Or sorry, five tails there. Is your friend lucky or is your friend cheating? Well, when we would see that, we may think, okay, something screwy is going on. That, that coin doesn't seem like it's exactly fair. However, we're going to set up what we call a, a null hypothesis stating that, well, let's go into the assumption saying that the coin is fine. But my goal is to try to prove the alternative hypothesis, the opposite of this, the saying that the coin is not fair. This would be an example of a hypothesis test coming up with what we believe to be true and trying to either refute or accept that. Well, either refute or defend it would be the better way of putting it. So both of those terms we, we use, null and alternative hypothesis, do have specific meaning. The null hypothesis, or what we call H sub zero, I'll probably just, you'll hear me say H null, um, is a statement to be tested indicating no change, no effect, or difference. It is given the burden of proof, which means that it needs or, uh, to be either, it, it either need, it's either going to be refuted or it's going to either not be refuted. It's one of the, tr uh, one of the two. It'll be the statement that indicates that there is no change, that there's nothing wrong, there is no change in value from one point to another. And that means that we're always going to indicate a null hypothesis with an equal sign. Now, in other statistics, we would sometimes use null hypothesis with a less than or equal to or greater than or equal to sign. It depends. But here we're just going to do the simple version of it, which will keep null hypothesis to be an equal sign. So, for example, in the previous case, saying the coin is fair, we'd set up what we call the null hypothesis, saying h sub 0 is something like the proportion of heads is 0 0.5. That'd be an example of me stating that the null hypothesis being the proportion is that it's equal to something. The alternative hypothesis is, is the hypothesis that we're trying to prove, or the one that we're trying to support. However, we have to have evidence in order to prove that. For example, the alternative hypothesis, which we either do h sub 1 or h sub a, depending on who you talk to, we'll keep with h sub 1 here, would be that I would think that the proportion of heads is not equal to 0 0.5. Maybe I think that it's greater than that. Maybe I think that it's less than that. Either way, I'm trying to show the opposite. I'm trying to show that the null hypothesis is not the case. All right. So the first step in hypothesis te testing is making these hypotheses. We will always make these uh, first, at least after we've confirmed that we can work with normality. So once we have those set up, we'll collect some evidence and we'll have ways of uh, doing that. And it'll basically still be based off the normal distribution model. So we'll still be doing st uh, stuff that involves that. And once we have that evidence, we'll use that evidence to either to analyze the data to either reject the null hypothesis or not reject the null hypothesis. Note that I don't say that we either reject the null hypothesis or we accept it. We will never say accept hypothesis. So never say that we accept the null hypothesis to be true. It's the one that we're either going to reject or we fail to reject, meaning we don't have enough information yet 
that means that we could have more information in the future. My goal is not to prove it to be true. My goal is to prove that it is false. So that's all that I can really state. If I fail to reject, that means I do not have enough evidence to conclude H1 is true. If I do reject null hypothesis, that means I do have enough evidence and I can accept the alternative instead. So keep that in mind, it's gonna be very particular. Never say that we accept the null hypothesis. So uh, with the coin example, I could say that um, I, I have enough evidence to show that the coin is not fair or I have simply not proved that the coin is uh, unfair. So I, I haven't proved uh, it to be false yet. Now, when we set up hypotheses, the type of alternative hypothesis I set up before is, is what we would call a two-tailed hypothesis test, where the alternative is set up to be a not equal to sign. If it's a not equal to sign, that means it's two-tailed, which means we're looking at both the high end and the low end either if my value is really far above my expected number or really far below. If I do have an indicated direction, particularly with the previous example of a coin, maybe I specifically wanted to check if the proportion of heads was significantly less than 0.5. Then I would set up what we call a left tail test, which would set up that the parameter is less than some indicated value. We could also do right tail tests indicating greater than both of these just checking one tail of a normal hypothesis. Left tail will be checking to see if compared to my mean, is my value down here significantly less than that? What is the area here? That's what I'll be trying to find out. If I'm doing a right tailed, I'm doing the exact opposite. I have a mean set up in the middle, an X bar or some value to test above that. And I'm trying to find the area up there and trying to find the likelihood of that. So that'd be the difference between left-tailed and right-tailed. Two-tailed, we'll look at both sides. All right, now some examples on some of these, uh, how we would interpret these or my uh, conclusions. If you reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true, that means that this is a correct analysis. That means that we did a good job, that we did reject the null hypothesis when we were supposed to. If we did not reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true, which again, we only know it's true if we were like an all seeing God and we know what the actual case was. If the null hypothesis actually was true and we did fail to reject the null hypothesis, that means we did a good job again. That means we had the correct conclusion with what we were working with. However, we do, we can run into some errors and these are things that we hope to avoid. If we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis actually is true, this is going to be called type one error. And that means that we made a mistake. That means that we rejected when we should not have, which is a big problem. The reason that it's a big problem is typically when you uh, take the alternative hypothesis instead, you show the alternative hypothesis is supposedly true. That usually means that action needs to be taken. And we'll see a couple examples of that. If action needs to be taken, then that means that whoever was running the hypothesis test is going to have to either spend more money, time, resources, something in order to fix the problem that the hypothesis test was looking for. However, if you fail to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis was actually true, meaning when you should have rejected, we call that type two error and that is also a problem. However, it is less of a problem. The reason that this is less of a problem is because this can easily be, easily be fixed by doing more testing. And that's usually what happens when we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That simply means that we have not rejected the null hypothesis with the available data. If we have more data or if we do more testing, we perhaps could end up with a case where we do eventually reject the null hypothesis. Which is why type two error, which is Failing to reject when you should is not the biggest issue in the world. Type one error is gonna be the main one that we're going to want to avoid here. This little table here kind of summarizes those uh, four above. If uh, the, alter the null is true, and again, this is assuming that we, again, are an all-knowing God. We, we know exactly what is true and what is not true. If it was the case that the null is true and we failed to reject it, that means that we did a good job. 
or if we rejected the null hypothesis when the alternative was actually true, that means we did a good job. Either of these, however, would be indicated as errors. And type 1 error, which we rep rec uh, represent with the probability that we use the letter alpha for, that is going to be the big one we want to avoid. Beta will be the letter that we represent for type 2 error. Now, in most hypothesis testing, it's all about trying to strike another balancing act. A lot of statistics is about this. The balancing act here is trying to balance alpha and beta. If you make type 1 error less likely, so you minimize alpha, what happens in response is that type 2 error becomes far more likely. And the same is true if you try to adjust the other way around. If you try to make type 2 error less likely, so you try to minimize the value of beta, then that means alpha or the likelihood of type 1 error becomes more and more likely. So we try to strike a balancing act, but again, for our purposes, we're mainly going to focus on type 1 error and that alpha being called a level of significance. So that level of significance is the likelihood of making type 1 error. We will typically set that pretty low. A lot of times you'll see either 0 0.01, 0 0.05, or in some rare cases, 0 0.10, indicating that we have a 1%, 5%, or 10%, 10 respectively chance of making type 1 error. Okay, so that's a bunch of uh, background. Now let's go through a couple examples of this. According to strayed.org, 22% of married people have strayed at least once during their married lives. However, the mayor of Salt Lake City believes the proportion of married people that have strayed in Utah is lower than the national average. So what we're going to do is run through this and check. So the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is that there is no change. In this case, what we are looking at is a proportion. So that's going to be my parameter of interest. My parameter of interest for both of these is going to be P. For my null hypothesis, my null hypothesis is always an equal sign, indicating that there is no change from the assumed value. That assumed value in this case being 22%, or I'll say 0.22. So the null hypothesis is saying that there is no difference between the married people in Utah than there are in the United in the rest of the United States or whatever this population was from. However, the mayor is trying to say that this val that the proportion is actually less in Utah than it is in other places. So less than 0.22. That means that since we are looking at less than, we're looking at a left-tailed test. We're looking at an instance where 0.22 being in the middle we're trying to show that our value is significantly less than that. All right, so type 1 error. What we're going to analyze here is what type 1 error and type 2 error would mean in context. So type 1 error, I think I'm going to type this out because it's, I just want to make sure it's uh, cleaner to read. Okay, so type 1 error. This would be the likelihood of rejecting the null hypothesis when we shouldn't. So this is where we believe that the, um, so we reject the null hypothesis when we shouldn't. So we believe that the proportion of married, what, couples, uh, married people, we believe that the ma proportion of married people in Utah who have strayed is significantly less than the national average, which is what the alternative is trying to show. The alternative is trying to show that the proportion is significantly less than the national average, when actually this is not true. So that's what type 1 error would mean. Now, that's what type 1 error would mean. And notice I'm not saying that when actually the proportion is equal to 0.22, which I, which I could. Um, but I since I'm only looking at left tail tests, I'm, that means I'm also not really checking to see if the proportion is higher. So I simply just want to say that um, my conclusion was wrong. 
Likewise, with type 2 error, we believe that the proportion of married people in Utah who have strayed is no different than the national average, which is what the null hypothesis was saying. So this is where we fail to reject the null hypothesis when we actually should. So that's what the null hypothesis is when actually the proportion is actually less than the national average. All right. So that would be an example of what's, how we would uh, try to represent type 1 and type 2 error. There's no exact way of explaining it for type 1 and type 2 error. It's all about what it means in context. And that's what I was trying to do here. I was trying to take what the null alternative hypothesis meant based on my description given. Based on that description, what did the hypotheses mean? And since type 1 error was the likelihood of rejecting when you shouldn't, and type 2 is failing to reject when you should, I just try to put those two in context. So, then our conclusions. If we uh, reject the null hypothesis, so at the conclusion, if H null is rejected, then that means we believe that the proportion of adults, I'll say people, in Utah who stray is significantly less than the national average, which is what the alternative hypothesis is trying to say. Alternatively, if we uh, fail to reject the null hypothesis, we do not have enough evidence to claim that the proportion is less than the national average. That's a much better way of putting it. So we do not have enough evidence yet. Note that that addresses possible type 2 error there. All right, so that's an example of a hypothesis test. So we got a couple more on page 3 and page 4. I'm going to work through the last one, page three, and then I recommend trying your own on page four. All right. According to QSR Magazine, Chick-fil-A has an accuracy of drive through orders with 96.4% uh, of all of its drive through orders filled correctly. So that's relatively high. Uh, the manager of a competing fast food restaurant believes her drive through is more accurate. So... Again, that is a percentage, which means that we're analyzing a proportion yet again. So what we're analyzing is P. And that's how we're going to write both the null and alternative hypothesis. Then the value that we're checking is at 96.4% or 0.964. I will also include that value in both parts of my hypothesis test. The two hypotheses, the only difference should be the symbol in the middle. For the null hypothesis, it's always an equal to sign, saying that, that the proportion is no different than it is for Chick-fil-A. However, this manager is trying to claim that it is significantly higher than that, so that their proportion is bigger than 0.964. That means that we're looking at a right-tailed test. All right. Now, type 1 error. Type 1 error in context. So, 1... We believe that the accuracy of the manager's uh, fast food restaurant is significantly higher than Chile. when this is not the case. 
Now, I hinted earlier that the reason why no the type 1 error is so egregious is because that usually means that action is taken. And this, the reason that um, type 1 error would be a large problem is because in most instances, if type 1 error is made, then that means that this manager is going to take action. The action that they'll likely take is something like putting in promotion material or in advertisements that their fast food restaurant has a higher percentage of accuracy when uh, filling out drive through orders, which can be a, a big turning point or, or a big selling point for them. However, if that is not actually the case, then that means that they are advertising fraudulent information, which can be a big legal problem. Alternatively, if type 2 error is made, that means that the manager, or we believe, make sure that we type right here, uh, we believe that there is no significant difference from the manager's restaurant and Chick-fil-A for drive through orders when actually there is. Note that I'm not really filling that out exactly at the same time last time. That's because, again, you can interpret these in a little bit of a different way. This one is simply saying that we fail to reject when actually we should. Failing to reject implies that the alternative hypothesis seems okay, which, which means that we haven't shown that there isn't, is any significant difference, when actually we should have rejected and said the alternative was true at, instead, which is that there is a significant difference between the two. Now, if H null is not rejected, then again, we're going to analyze this by saying that we do not have enough information to claim that the proportion of drive-through orders completed accurately is significantly higher than that of Chick-fil-A. Something along those lines. Notice again, I'm putting it in terms of what the alternative hypothesis is, which is that they have a higher percentage or proportion than Chick-fil-A does, but I'm making sure that we're saying that we don't have enough information yet, or we don't have enough information, because that simply means that we could in the future, maybe if we do more sampling. So that hopefully can alleviate type two error. All right, so as I said, go ahead and try these, see how you do. Um, so pause the video and try the ones on page four and then unpause when you're done. A can of soda is labeled as containing 12 fluid ounces. The quality control manager wants to verify that the filling machine is neither overfilling nor underfilling. So in this case, we're looking at 12 fluid ounces. We're not looking at a proportion. We're seeing like how many of them are under overfilling. We're just looking at what value they have. So what value they have for filling or overfilling. So that means what we're looking for is a mean. We're going to look at the average number of fluid ounces in cans. So for both of these, we're going to look at the mean. For the null hypothesis, I'm going to claim that it is equal to 12 fluid ounces. That, that means that it is okay that there's no problem with the machine. However, the quality control manager wants to make sure they're neither overfilling, so they're not wasting resources, or underfilling, which could lead to lawsuits. That means that they want to make sure that is neither above or less than 12. So that means we're going to look at not equal to 12. That would check a two-tailed test, making sure that we're neither a, a too high above 12 or too far below. Suppose a control manager takes 75 cans and measures, me, measures the contents. The sample evidence leads, should say leads, so it should have a D in there, uh, leads the manager to reject the null hypothesis. Write a conclusion for the hypothesis test. So if they rejected the null hypothesis, and that means that they accepted the alternative to be true. So that means that the manager believes, whoop, take away caps. Um, the manager believes 
that the uh, the machine is over or under filling the cans. So that's what the manager actually believes. That's what they believe is actually happening. Um, so they have enough evidence for that. However, it then says, suppose in fact the machine is not out of calibration. Has type 1 or type 2 error been made? So that means that in fact what they assumed to be true was wrong. That means that their conclusion ended up being wrong. Their conclusion was that they rejected the null hypothesis. And if it is not out of calibration, that means that they shouldn't have. Rejecting when you should not uh, reject, that is type 1 error. And that's the big problem. If in this case, if that happens, if they uh, rejected the null hypothesis saying that the machine is filling, um, that is either over or under filling the cans, that means that they're going to send somebody to go fix that machine. They're going to send a mechanic to go and replace and fix that machine. It'll either cost money in terms of getting a new machine, maybe new parts, it'll cost money for a repair person, or it'll cost time. Any of those things. And all of those are things that's a company would like to avoid if type 1 error was made then that means that they sent somebody to go fix it when actually it's fine when there's no problems with it that's a huge issue so that's why we want to avoid type 1 error as much as we can the last example here according to popcorn.org the mean consumption of popcorn annually by Americans is 54 quarts the marketing division of popcorn.org unleashes an, aggress an aggressive campaign de designed to get Americans to consume more popcorn. So since we have an actual amount, we're not saying something like uh, proportion or anything, and also we have the word mean given to us, we know that the parameter of interest we're looking for is mu. So that's going to be my parameter of interest in both these cases. For my null hypothesis, it's always equal to, and the equal to is equal to 54. This would essentially be saying that their campaign yielded little results. It did not change the amounts of popcorn that's annually consumed by Americans. However, their goal is to get Americans to consume more popcorn. So that means their goal is that it is bigger than 54. That's what they want to show is true after their campaign to show that the campaign was effective. It means we're looking at a right tail test. A sample of 800 Americans provides enough evidence to conclude that the marketing campaign was not effective. Provide a statement that should be put out by the marketing department. Okay, so it, saying that it is not effective, that means that they failed to reject. So this is failed to reject. Means they did not have enough information to reject the null hypothesis. So in that case, the way that we're going to word that, um, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, that means that we say that we do not, or we maybe did not get enough evidence to claim that the marketing campaign was effective in getting Americans, say, yeah, Americans to consume more popcorn. So that's putting the alternative into context. Notice again the wording that I'm using there, saying that we did not get enough evidence. I'm using that wording very specifically, making sure that we're saying that we haven't proved this true yet. That doesn't mean that the campaign didn't do anything, it's just based on our sample results, we didn't see enough evidence yet. Or at least enough statistical significant evidence. However, it then says, However, it then says, suppose in fact the mean annual consumption of popcorn after the marketing campaign has increased. So it means it actually did increase over that period of time. That means that we failed to reject the null hypothesis when we actually should. When we actually should say that the mean amount of popcorn consumed is more than 54 quarts. That means if we fail to reject when we should, that is type 2 error. 
All right. So in this section, 10.1, our main goal was to get you used to what hypothesis testing is, the specific wording that we use with it, before we actually go into some examples of it. Um, so this was kind of setting you up so you understand how to set up hypothesis testing, how do you analyze them, and now in 10.2 and 10.3, we'll talk about how you actually calculate the values uh, in the middle to analyze a hypothesis test. But with that said, that's everything that we have today for section 10.1. I recommend going into the homework and trying that out on your own. Uh, with that said, I hope this helped and I hope that you have a good day.